It's about the top of the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the webinar is seeing, really believing, visual help misinformation. Thanks so much for coming and my name is Carolyn Martin and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Network of the National Library of Medicine, Region 5, and I'll be your host for today's session. Some of you might be first-time attendees to one of our webinars, so I'd like to share just a few words about who we are. The NLM, the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices at the National Institutes of Health. It is the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources such as PubMed and Medline Plus. The NNLM, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM, working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, as well as several national offices and centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to its over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. If you would like to connect with your regional medical library or learn more about how to become an organizational network member, you can check out our website, and that information link is in the chat box for you. Today's session is part of the NNLM's new Health Misinformation webinar series. This series uh, features presentations from expert guest speakers like ours today, and will enable librarians, public health professionals, health educators, and healthcare providers to explore various aspects of health misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, and to learn practical and evidence-based solutions for how to identify it and how to stop its spread. These presentations will be scheduled intermittently throughout the year, and you can learn more about these sessions by checking out our NNLM training calendar or by following your regional medical library's newsletter, blog, and social media. It is my great pleasure to introduce our three speakers for today's session. We have Kelsey Cowles, um, Coles and Rachel Suppock and Rebecca Miller, who are all research and instruction librarians at the University of Pittsburgh Health Sciences Library System. So welcome to all of you, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, Carolyn, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Kelsey Coles, and I'm here with Rachel and Rebecca, my colleagues, and we're really excited to be here today to talk with you a little bit about visual health misinformation. Um, like Carolyn said, we will try to keep an eye on the chat while we're presenting, so if you have a question or a comment, feel free to drop that in there anytime. Um, we do have a pretty large audience today, so um, we will try to get to questions as we go, but maybe we don't see your question or we don't get a chance to get to it. Um, if we have extra time at the end, we'll be happy to answer it then, or you can definitely send us an email. We're happy to chat with you after the session today as well. All right, so we have a few goals for today. Um, first, for you to better understand why we think visual health information literacy skills matter and how the skill set is a bit different from regular misinformation identification skills. Second, we're going to give you some tips for identifying and interpreting misinforma misinformation, visual misinformation. Um, <clears throat> And alongside that, we're going to talk about what the impact of these misleading visualizations can be on the messages that are conveyed by the data behind them. Um, we've also got some ideas at the end for incorporating this topic into library programming, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, yes, go Pitt. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <clears throat> um, so anyways, to get us thinking a little bit, uh, I want to talk about this image on this slide uh, with a caption. So there's an image of some packages of breast milk up top. The left one is like a normal color and the right one is a little bit greenish um, and it's labeled COVID positive. Um, and then there's some text caption below um, sort of explaining why this is in theory. Um, so this is a screenshot from Facebook. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you. Um, you can answer either or both of these questions in the chat. Um, first, you know, how do you feel about the reliability of this information and why? And second, and 
maybe what I'm a little bit more interested in even is how does the image affect your perception of this information? So do you think you would feel the same about it if it was only the text? Or does the image make it feel more believable or less believable to you? So let me know what you think. I see someone says a uh, low reliability, although the image is an attention grabber, not reliable with or without image. It looks unbelievable to me. I'd be worried about that. <laughs> um, let's see, the image is off-putting. I think pictures make something seem more reliable. Um, doesn't have a source, it's playing with emotions. No reference, not believable, it's iffy. Yeah, so there's definitely like a lot of skepticism about the information, um, but some other people had some different reactions to the image. So they think it, um, it's attention grabbing or it makes it maybe seem more believable, although some people actually felt the opposite, which was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so just to give you like a little bit of sort of the, the right answer here, so to speak. Um, so this image, these images like these have gone around a lot. Um, and so there is like a little kernel of truth to this sort of claim. So there is evidence that there is some sort of like biological communication between a breastfeeding parent and a baby so that if the baby is sick, um, then the breastfeeding parent will sometimes um, generate antibodies that can be found in the breast milk. Um, however, there's no evidence that these would turn breast milk green, and this is more likely due to something else like a dietary change, like eating a bunch of spinach or something like that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rachel now for a little bit. Thanks, Kelsey. Um. So um, why are we talking about visual misinformation today? Basically because um, seeing is believing even when it maybe shouldn't be. Um, so people are more likely to believe a statement when it is accompanied by an image. Um, one study that helped to demonstrate this had P um, showed the participants um, both true and false statements about turtles. And some statements, both true and false, were accompanied by a picture of a turtle, and some were not. And they found that for both the true and false statements, people were more likely to believe them when there was an image accompanying, accompanying the statement. Um, the image didn't have to have anything really to do with it. It just had to be, you know, statement was about a turtle, the image was of a turtle, and that made people more likely to believe it. Um, so I guess I should have put a picture of a turtle on this slide to make myself more credible, but you'll just have to believe me anyway. Um, images are more likely to be remembered than words. This has been shown in many studies over time. Um, and also, as we all probably know from our own experiences, photos increase um, likes and shares on social media posts. So, you know, uh, that Facebook post included an image which probably increased um, how much it was shared versus if it had just been the text. So what this means is that um, images are more likely to be spread widely on social media and they are more likely to be remembered and or believed. Um, so there are some different ways that visuals can support misinformation. Um, and um sorry i just saw the thing in the chat about the reference for the turtle info um i'm not sure if that one's in the slides but we can um i can find it and share it in the chat in a minute um when i'm done with my talking part um so there's some different ways that visuals can support misinformation um one way is by implying a connection without expl explicitly stating it so here there is a uh, a tweet and with the tweet, there's a screenshot from the CDC's website showing the toxicological profile for vinyl chloride. There's no link, just a screenshot. Um, and then the tweet says that basically a couple of weeks before the train derailment in Ohio, um, the CDC updated its toxicological profile on vinyl chloride, and the update changed the lethal exposure from 100 parts per million to 100,000 parts per million. And then they ask, what are the odds? So while they're not explicitly saying that this is some sort of government conspiracy and that the CDC is in on it, um, just having this 
screenshot that allegedly shows their point, um, along with the sort of just asking questions um, tweet, does seem to imply that there is a conspiracy at hand. Um, and so the screenshot is real, but it doesn't actually show that the lethal exposure was changed. And in fact, the lethal exposure was not changed. Um, the toxicological profile was updated in um, January 2023, but that's a very common thing. Lots of toxicological profiles get updated all the time. A second way that visuals can support misinformation are by misrepresenting or impersonating authoritative institutions. Um, so here we have some statements about monkeypox that are all untrue. Um, and it has listed as the source as being the WHO and then also has the BBC News logo. However, this is completely made up. You know, the BBC News never shared this, neither did WHO. But it's very easy to just copy a logo and slap it on something and even kind of, you know, copy the formatting or the font. I've seen this also with like New York Times headlines that don't exist, but they're in that very distinct format and font that we all recognize. Um, and then, of course, having something, a screenshot, is a lot easier to fake versus if they actually had shared a link to the BBC website where you could go to the website yourself and see whether or not this was something the BBC had said. Another way visuals can support misinformation is by co-opting the aesthetics of science. So in this image, there is a very, uh, you know, kind of fancy anatomical rendering of someone's, uh, you know, head and neck with a glowing thyroid gland. Um, and this, the caption on this Instagram post talks a lot about uh, thyroid hormones um, and T3, and then it ends up going in a very anti-vaxxer direction somehow connected to your thyroid. Um, but basically, the images like this um, are just trying to imply that there is some element of science supporting what they're saying. This is also how you might see you know, someone looking through a microscope or in a lab coat or wearing a stethoscope around their neck to try to suggest that there is a doctor or scientist involved. Um, kind of like in drug commercials, sometimes you'll see, you know, someone with like a pipette or doing something and at the bottom of the screen it's like, this is just an actor. And finally, um, visuals can just provide uh, evidence to support a false claim and evidence in quotes because I'm talking about things that are staged or edited or could be a real image but mislabeled or taken out of context. So this example is um, not really health related, but it was too good to pass up. So this tweet uh, says that NATO sent jet fighters and helicopters to help Ukraine um, in fighting Russia, and that only China has been able to see the video. And then it shows what is the video here. I just have a screenshot, but it was a video in the tweet. Um, but this evidence to support, the, the evidence to show that NATO fighters were sent in, um, is completely false, and this isn't even from real life at all. It's actually from a 2012 video game. And back over to Kelsey. Thank you, Rachel. So uh, we're going to be talking about um, several different categories of misinformation, visual misinformation today. Um, and I'm going to start off with a little bit about misleading graphs and charts. So I think that these are some of the most insidious because you unfortunately don't just see these coming from questionable information sources. Um, these also can come from reputable news sources, public health departments, um, places you would expect to get information that is presented accurately. And that's unfortunately not always the case. So, um, some things you can be alert for. Um, the first is axis manipulation. So, this often takes the form of truncating or omitting the zero point or the baseline. So, this can be useful if you're looking at values that are pretty similar to each other and you want to see the difference a little bit, um, but it can also be misleading for the same reason. You can also be aware of inverted axes or axes that start at a high value and then decrease to zero, um, charts that have two or more different vertical axes for different categories of data, um, ones where the scale is not consistent all the way across one of the axes or both of the axes, um, charts where there is no scale given, things like that. Um, you can also look out for data that is presented visually in just an unhelpful or even confusing way. So look out for like poor bin selection. So those are the color categories basically on maps like are on this slide. Um, and so that's the, the groupings of data, how the data are grouped together. Um, 
be on the lookout for too many or too few bins, the wrong bins. Basically, they just don't accurately show the data. Um, this slide has an example of how using specific bins versus actually a continuous color scale or no bins um, can give you two kind of different pictures of the same data. So again, not necessarily misinformation, but can be used to paint a certain picture, I'll say. Um, Let's see, uh, color choices can also be misleading or confusing, uh, especially if two similar colors or counterintuitive colors are used. Um, and of course, that would also be an accessibility issue to be on the lookout for. And then finally, beware of visualizations that omit context or certain parts of the data to give a particular impression. So the first chart on this slide shows the homicide rate in the U.S. from 2010 to 2020. Looks like it's a pretty steady and significant increase. Um, but if you look at the second chart, that is the rate from 1985 to 2020. So you can see that, yes, there's been a slight recent increase, but it's well below um, the all-time high, right? So depending on how you sort of crop this data, you can uh, use it to, um, to paint a very different picture. Um, also look out for visuals that are presented without the needed context, um, that are presenting total numbers instead of numbers per capita, if per capita would be more informative, or that are implying a correlation between two things that are clearly not connected. Um, so here's an example of that one in action. Um, you've probably seen these before. They're really fun. Um, so note the use here of two slightly different y-axes uh, with different types of data on them. And the fact that despite these two trends, this, despite the fact that these two trends are presented on the same graph, um, there's no reason to believe that these two things, the letters in the winning word of the spelling bee and the number of people killed by venomous spiders, um, would be related in any meaningful way. So next we're going to take a look at a few graphs together. So I'm going to show you a graph or a chart, and I'd like you to share with me in the chat what you see that is misleading about it um, and how it changes the message of that graph. All right, so here's our first um, chart. We have gun deaths in Florida, the number of murders committing, committed using firearms between the 1990s and the 2010s, coming to us from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And yes, I see some folks have already identified the main issue here is that that y-axis is inverted. So it's got zero at the top and like 800 or 1,000 at the bottom. And so... Of course, what that's doing is when you look at it quickly, you see, oh, there's this quick decrease in gun deaths, right, in after 2005 when Florida enacts its Stand Your Ground law, when in fact it's actually the opposite. It's a, a sudden increase. So this um, graphic is a bit misleading, I would say. Um, and yeah, the, the x-axis is also like a little bit weird with the way they've um, put the years. I think probably this came, so this came out in the middle of the 2010s, so they like did not have the full 2010s there. Um, but um, yeah, that is also like a little bit odd looking. Um, and yeah, that is a real graph that came out from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Um, these are all uh, real graphs taken uh, from the wild. Um, this one comes to us uh, originally from the Fox News Channel, um, and it's looking at COVID-19 cases in the U.S. in um, early 2020. Uh, so let me know what you see here. Yeah, I see a question cumulative. We don't actually know, <laughs> know how they're counting these, um, so that's definitely a good question. Um, and the scales are weird. Scales are all over the place. Um, yeah, so that was the main thing that I hoped you would catch here, and it's actually on both of the axes, right? So um, the x-axis has like uh, eight days, nine days, five days, five days, four days between the time points, so they're not evenly distributed. The y-axis is also not evenly distributed. It goes zero, five, I assume 5,000, although I did see a question in the chat. It's not entirely clear. Um, 5,000 and then 20,000, so the increments go from 5,000 to 15,000. So um, if you actually like plotted this evenly, I think the slope would end up looking steeper than it actually does. So maybe that's a motivation for them to have done this. All right, the next graph. Um, so this is uh, top five counties with the greatest number of confirmed COVID cases in April and May 
of uh, 2020. This com came from the Georgia Department of Health. Um, I will say that they were criticized for it and they took it down, but the internet is forever, so we still have it to use as an example of a confusing or misleading graph or chart. So let me know what you see here. Yeah, I see a lot of comments coming in about the colors. So yeah, the background and then the colors on top of it is kind of uh, hard to see. The colors are changing order between the different uh, time points. Um, yes, and I see people are now catching that the dates are out of order. So it goes, uh, it's, sorry, it's very small and it's hard to read. Um, it goes from April 28th, April 27th, April 29th, May 1st, April 30th, May 4th, May 6th, May 5th, etc. So they basically put these in order in, so it looks like it's decreasing. Um, and I don't know why they did that. Um, obviously, they were criticized for that. So um, that is a major problem here. Um, it's also, as someone has mentioned, it's unclear between um, deaths and hospitalizations. Are they just adding those up here? It's like, I don't know what this chart is even trying to show in some cases. So um, I like to call this the, the hot mess chart because it's, it's a hot mess. <laughs> Um, okay, and we have one more map here coming up from, again, the Georgia Department of Health. Um, so here we have two maps with some uh, COVID cases sorted into bins between July 2nd and July 17th. So let me know uh, what you see here. Yeah, the bins are changed. So between the first date and the second date, basically it got harder to be in the dark blue or the red bins. So um, it makes it look like there isn't a lot of change between those two dates when in fact there might have been um, significant change. So yeah, that one is uh, unfortunate as well. And then just one more to give you um, a, a visual of what it can look like when you compare um, numbers versus rate. So take a look at California here on this map on the West Coast. Um, in the first map, which is number of new cancers, it's dark blue. You might think, oh no, like California has a lot of cancer. What's going on here? But you probably know California has a very high population. And when you actually look at it um, in terms of rate, California is in like the lowest light blue category in the map on the right. So it's just an example of how those can give very different messages if you're not careful about um, what you're looking at. Uh, and I will hand it back over to Rachel now. All right. Um, and I did drop the link to the study that mentions the turtles in the um, chat, if anyone was interested in that. So next I'm going to be talking about um, images taken out of context. Um, here we have an image of a dog uh, taken from the Out of Context Adorable Dogs Twitter account, but unfortunately most images taken out of context are, are, are not quite as adorable. Um, so what we're looking at here when I talk about images taken out of context are mainly real photos or videos, but just put in the wrong context. You don't necessarily need to do any doctoring or photoshopping to have a, um, an image misrepresented. So here we have um, an Instagram post. I don't know why I said it's a tweet on the slide. It's an Instagram post um, from someone named Benny Johnson who says, this is what they've done to our country. And the implication here is that the they is Joe Biden and or the Democrats um, and talking about the US. So there is, the image says your stores and has some empty grocery shelves, your cities and has just like a crowded scene with some tents and people on the street, and then your borders, which has people lined up by um, a fence, and then their vacation at the bottom. PolitiFact identified the actual sources of the photos in this post, and um, the only one that is actually from the United States during the Biden administration is the one of their vacation that is in fact the Biden family on vacation. Uh, while he was president. Um, the top one that supposedly is your stores is actually from London in 2020, so not the US. Your cities is Mexico 2021, also not the US. Um, and then your borders is actually Texas, but it is Texas in 2019 before Biden was president. Um, so again, just a way of taking images that are all real, but saying that they are something that they are not. And we have that again here. Um, 
with an image overhead view of a large crowd of people in a city somewhere. And it says Berlin right now protesting the COVID hack hoax. Um, but this has been miscaptioned. It is actually of a music festival and parade that took place in August of 2019 in Switzerland. So not in Berlin and also pre-COVID. Um, but, you know, how are you supposed to know this if you're not really familiar with the topography of Berlin or Switzerland? Um, it would be hard to tell. So one tool you can use to find the original context of photos is a reverse image search. So there are lots of tools out there for doing a reverse image search, apps you can download and things like that. Um, if you use Chrome as your browser, Google makes it really easy to do a reverse image search in Chrome. So all you have to do is right click on an image um, and then from the little menu that comes up, choose search image with Google. So in this case, uh, there was a Facebook post that had an image of people lying in a street and it originally said that this was people lying dead in the streets of China from COVID-19. However, after you do the search image with Google, there are a bunch of matches online, um, including some from reliable sources such as uh, Reuters. And there you will find out that this is actually um, from 2014, and this time it is in Germany, and it is people um, protesting the new pedestrian zoning uh, laws. So the people are not dead, it's well before COVID, and it is in Germany, not China. Um, you can also do this in using Google Images, even if you don't use Chrome as your browser. Um, by going to Google Images and clicking on the little camera icon. And then from there, you can upload a file of an image or put a URL of an image, and it'll do the same thing where it'll visually match you to um, where any other place that that image has showed up online. Uh, the caveat for reverse image searches is that this is only going to work if the image has already been shared elsewhere online. So if someone is using a photo um, that they themselves took or that you know, they found, you know, privately from someone else's files, not publicly available online, then you would not be able to necessarily find the original source. Um, but a lot of times these images are just ripped off from um, other websites. Sometimes you'll need to play detective. Um, so you need to think about, are you looking at the original or is it a screenshot? Um, so, again, screenshots make it really easy to fake things. Um, orientation and size can offer clues as to where it was originally shared. So, for example, on um, TikTok, videos are normally in like a, a long, tall form. And so if you see something that's like short and horizontal, um, you know, landscape on TikTok, that means it was probably not originally shared using that app. Um, if a video or image is outside, you can look for clues to location that way. So languages on signs or street signs, um, notable landmarks. For videos, um, while you can't reverse image search the actual video, you could reverse image search a screenshot or a thumbnail. Um, and also always look for things that could be very easily edited. Uh, a sign someone is holding up is very easy to edit to say something else. Um, okay. And handing this over. All right, thank you again, Rachel. So um, this next topic, um, it's been sort of like in the news a little bit in the last six months or so, um, particularly surrounding Alzheimer's research, um, because it turned out that some really highly cited research um, that had actually shaped that field for years has now been called into question based partially on evidence of image manipulation, as well as some other methodological concerns. Um, you can find more about that with a quick search. I think I can grab the link for you if you're interested in reading a story about that as well. Um, so that's not related to the image on this slide, I will say. Um, so here's a study from back in 2016 that found that almost a 4% of a huge study sample of, bi of biomedical research papers contain problematic images, with half of those appearing to contain images that were deliberately manipulated. Um, they also found that this problem had been increasing in recent years, likely due to um, you know, image editing software being more available and the fact that more and more people have the skills to use it. So um, here is 
an example. Sorry, let me just get to the right side. Here we go. Um, so here's an example of um, what that might look like. So if you look at the image on the left, um, you probably don't notice anything fishy just looking at this, um, unless you are a very trained eye at this already. Um, but if you look really closely or you look at the image on the right that has the problematic areas uh, circled in the colored boxes, um, you may start to notice that a lot of uh, parts of this image are actually basically copy-pasted from other parts. So the um, different colored boxes correspond to pairs that have been um, duplicated. So those are definitely not easy to spot. Um, I want to give you a little chance to try it yourself. So take a minute, look at this image. Um, you don't need to tell me in the chat, but you can if you want to. Um, if you've spotted any uh, things here that you think are um, duplicated in some way. And be aware that they might be duplicated and then like slightly resized or something like that so they look slightly different, but they're actually um, the same. So. Take a minute to look at that. If you do find something, just give me like a yes in the chat. Um, or if you don't find something, give me a no in the chat. How's that? All right, I see some yeses. Oh, this is great. I'm so glad. Sometimes uh, it's really tough to spot these. So I'm really glad that um, you've been able to see some examples of this. So I want to sort of give you the answer key here. Um, Probably if you had a little more time, you could have spotted more of these. But um, it turns out that almost all of that image, like maybe three quarters of it, um, is uh, composed of um, copy-pasted little Western blot um, sections. So um, this has been referred to sort of tongue-in-cheek as the ransom note method of image or figure assembly, often seen with these Western blot type figures. Um, you know, because like for ransom notes in the movies, people will cut out the little letters and stick them together, which is um, basically what's happening here, which is um, concerning, I will say. Um, if you've heard about this issue before, you might also have heard the name Elizabeth Bick. Um, she's not the only person who searches for these manipulated image, images, but she is the most public and the most willing to put her name with her critiques. Um, she also does a lot of work identifying other areas of potential scientific fraud as well. So she estimated, and this is uh, as of 2020 only, uh, that her discoveries had led to at least 172 retractions, over 300 errata and corrections, so I'm sure those numbers are significantly higher now. She also helped uncover a paper mill that was responsible for over 400 papers um, because a lot of those papers had reused, duplicated, or manipulated images. Uh, and she was the lead author on that 2016 study that I mentioned a moment ago. And so when that study came out, she and her co-authors uh, took those 800 questionable papers that they found, um, and they alerted the journals that they were published in, like, hey, you might want to take a look at these because it appears that um, there might be some fraud here. Uh, unfortunately, five years after that, she reported that only 30 to 40 percent of those papers had had any action of any sort taken on them. So 60 to 70 percent were still out there, no notes, no expressions of concern, corrections, retractions. Um, and I see someone in the chat has already alerted you to this fact. Um, but her Twitter is awesome. Um, she's a really fun follow. Um, she does little challenges where she posts some of those manipulated images, and then she hands out little emoji trophies to the first people who um, identify the problematic areas in the images. So I have personally learned a lot from following her. Um, so the thought might have crossed your mind by now that detecting these types of issues might be something that could be automated or um, that AI could be used for that. And you are correct. Um, however, so far, um, AI that's been developed to work on this problem tends to basically it flags a ton of images. So it says, you know, all, you know, these 5,000 images might be a problem. And then someone has to go through all those and pick out like a few of them that are actually problematic. So there is still a need for human oversight here. Um, there are some new tools on the market that are aimed at publishers to use on submitted manuscripts. As you can see, this is actually going back a couple of years. Um, so some journals have started doing this, um, but I do not think it is um, like ubiquitous at this point by any means. 
Um, also, I will say that AI should not be viewed as a perfect band-aid for this issue or for most issues, in my opinion, um, because it can also be used to facilitate fraud. And Rebecca will talk a little bit more about that um, in just a second. But in the meantime, if you are interested in this issue, head over to Retraction Watch. Uh, they have a database where you can see the papers that have been retracted or corrected due to image issues. So when I took the screenshot, there were around 5,600. I checked earlier today and there were over 6,100 papers in this category now. So that's quite a few. So you can always use this to cross-check papers you or your faculty might be citing to make sure that they're not on this list. And you can also um, browse a feed of articles that have been retracted for image issues. So I'll hand it over to Rebecca now to talk about AI. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, so yes, we're going to talk about AI and the ways that AI can deceive us now. So before we get started, a few definitions. So what does AI stand for? Uh, artificial intelligence. And this is when machines can perform tasks that are normally uh, require people, right? So normally you'd need human intelligence, but machines are doing the work. Uh, machine learning, you may have heard that as well. That's a branch of AI. And it's this idea that uh, these machines and systems can learn from data. So they identify patterns, they can make decisions, uh, they can, again, they can do some of the things that we would normally have to do ourselves. Uh, and then a subset of that is deep learning. So you may have heard this term deep fake, or we're going to talk about deep fakes a little bit more. But basically, a deep fake is a portmanteau of deep learning and fake. And it's using uh, machine learning and AI techniques to create a manipulated either uh, video or audio or image uh, that is normally containing a real person. So it's a real person doing or saying something that they did not do in real life. So it's using these uh, techniques from AI to create something fake. Okay, so speaking of which, let's take a look at the three people on this, uh, this slide, and we're going to call this person number one, this person number two, and this person number three. And some of these people, I won't tell you how many, uh, are created by uh, AI, so they are machine generated. So which do you think are fake? So just let us know in the chat. So we've got uh, all of them. We have number one. Um, <laughs> one one's earrings don't match, which could be a fashion choice or it could be AI. One, maybe two. Okay, we have one vote for three. Okay, so let's uh, let's think about how we can tell. So one way to spot AI generated people is to look at the hands and there are no hands in those pictures. Uh, and so AI currently is not great at creating hands, although it is certainly uh, getting better at that. You also want to look at the background. So sometimes if something is created by AI, the person might look great, they, and, but the background is sort of fuzzy or sort of strange, like they're in some sort of vortex. Um, you also want to look at, as someone in the chat pointed out, you want to look at their accessories. So does their jewelry match? Uh, does their glasses go all the way around their head? Uh, you know, do their teeth match the rest of the face? Um, so those are some tips. And then you also can consider looking at the folds in fabric or skin. So it's extremely high contrast. That can sometimes be a hint that it is uh, actually AI generated. So if you all remember the Pope's puffy coat, there was a lot, there were a lot of folds in that fabric, which was maybe a hint that it was AI generated. So let's go back to these people really quick. And I will tell you that this person is number one. This person is AI generated, so this person does not exist. And as some of you pointed out, the earrings could be a fashion statement, but at this, at this uh, case, they are a hint that this person is not real. This person in the middle is real. So she does have this sort of fuzzy background, but that seems to be some sort of like a window. So this person is real. And then this person at the end is not real. And we can tell because of this like super strange background. Uh, there's some sort of like time warp thing going on in the background. And so that's how we can tell. OK. So let's take those uh, those tips and uh, try again. So. Uh, which of these people do we think are fake? So we've got one, two, and then three. So we have a two, a three, 
a two and a three. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing some sort of routine here. Um, okay, so this is great. So yes, you are correct. This first person is a real person. Uh, so the background again is sort of fuzzy, but it's artistic, right? Um, and then this person in the middle has some sort of strange background that is a hint that they are not real. And the same thing, uh, this person has some sort of like scarecrow or something over there. Uh, and so number two and three are our fake AI generated people. Okay, so those are just uh, images, but then we, as I mentioned before, there are deep fakes and deep fakes can be uh, images, audio or video. So the way deep fakes are created is that they are created by something called a GAN or a generative adversarial network. And basically what this is, is there are two neural networks and they have training data, but they try to create, so one tries to create something that's not in the training data, so it's, it's not real, right, it's fake, and it tries to trick the other one into thinking that it is a real thing that is from the training data, right? So they kind of, that's why they're adversarial, they're training against each other. So what happens is they train against each other and once the first one is fooling the second one about half the time, then it's ready to go and it's creating these, uh, <laughs> these plausible fake examples, so it's creating deep fakes. So that's how this is, is created. So where have you seen deepfakes? So you may have seen uh, advertisements for the new Indiana Jones <laughs> movie. They have uh, deepfakes of Harrison Ford, so he looks younger. Uh, so movies a lot of times will have, or at least recently they've been having um, deepfakes to de-age people or to have people in the movie who are already actually uh, dead. There was also recently a... Um, a documentary with Anthony Bourdain where they used his voice to, they made deep fakes of his voice to read his diaries. So they didn't actually have uh, recordings, but they were using deep fakes to make audio. You may also have seen the video of President Zelensky of Ukraine uh, that Russia created saying, you know, we surrender to, to Russia. It was a very poorly done deep fake, uh, but deep fakes can be used for disinformation and political propaganda. And then you also may have seen deep fakes on social media. So if you've seen the Unreal Keanu TikTok videos, uh, those are not really Keanu Reeves. They are deep fakes of him. Um, yeah, so the picture, I think you lended the picture of Trump being arrested was a deep fake. So things like that um, you have probably seen going around. Okay, so now in case you haven't seen a deep fake, we are going to watch a video. I will warn you, it's kind of quiet. So hopefully you'll all be able to hear it okay. And I just realized I probably did not share that. So I'm sorry. Um, let me actually share the video. That's terrible. Uh, you see the Instagram one on the... Oh, you did? You did? Okay. Well, we didn't... It didn't play, but we... You gave me my ratings and my fan base. I feel really blessed because I genuinely love the process of manipulating people online for money. Okay, I got too excited and <laughs> but hopefully you saw that um so if you didn't hear it it was uh kim kardashian saying that she likes to manipulate people for money and this was actually not a real video this is a a deep fake video of of kim so how can you tell that this is a deep fake um so some tips for you does the person's face look uh airbrushed are they blinking too much? Are they blinking too little? Um, does their, their head move and not the rest of their body? Or is their body moving and then the, not the head? Um, and people are noticing in the chat that uh, her lips weren't necessarily lining up with the words. Um, so, you know, are there shadows or are there no shadows? So these are all some sort of um, clues, but really the context clues are, are what's important here. So would Kim Kardashian really say, oh, you know, I enjoy manipulating people uh, for, for their data and for money? Probably not, right? Uh, but uh, deep fakes can be really, really hard to tell. Uh, so we do have some some links in the slides for some practice. MIT has a really good website where you can, you can practice um, detecting deep fakes. Okay, so a caveat to all of those tips is AI technology is constantly improving. Uh, and so as it gets better, the tells are going to go away. Um, so obviously, 
especially some of the more obvious ones, they will, it'll be harder to detect whether something is a deep fake or not. So you really want to look at images and think about context. So um, can you confirm the, the picture somewhere else? Can you confirm uh, that, you know, is anyone else reporting the video? Is anyone else reporting that <laughs> Kim Kardashian is saying that she likes to manipulate people? And if not, right, then this is probably just a deep fake. Um, okay. So deepfakes still require a lot of knowledge. They require um, uh, a lot of technology, right? So there are easier ways to spread misinformation. So that is uh, the good news. So we're probably a few years away from really good software that's highly accessible uh, that people can create deepfakes. So that's the bad news. But the good news is that AI that detects deepfakes is also being improved. Um, so. If you are a little bit alarmed by this idea of deepfakes, I do want to show you, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, people are creating commercials um, from AI, and so they are, are um, well, we'll see how, how good you think the technology is currently. So this is an AI-created commercial. Are you ready for best pizza of life? Bring friends down to Pepperoni Hug Spot. Our chefs make pizza with heart and special touch. Cheese, pepperoni, vegetable, and more secret things. Need delivery? Pizzas come fast. Knock, knock, who's there? Pizza magic. Eat pepperoni hug spot pizza. Your tummy say thank you. Your mouth say, mmm. Pepperoni hug spot. It's like family, but with more cheese. Okay, so uh, you can see that, oh, oh, so people are in the chat are saying that they're scared, but hopefully that's less scary because that's so clearly, uh, hopefully clearly not created by an actual uh, marketing agency. So you can see that the, the AI is not so good in that ad and you can definitely tell that they are not actual people. Okay, um, so just really quick before we talk about what you all might be able to do about all of this um, is that we want to remember that uh, as people learn more about fake images and videos, they start to not believe anything, right? You start thinking you can't believe anything that you see. This is called the liar's dividend. So um, where people can discredit something that's true by saying that it has to be fake, right? So you can't believe anything that you see. So I can tell you that, you know, this thing that you see that seems to be true, it's not true. You can't believe it, right? So we see this in politics all the time. Um, and we have to be careful about this, right? We can't stop believing anything. We have to remember that there is truth uh, and that, you know, we can verify things, right? But we don't want to distrust everything that we see all of the time. Uh, so just something to keep in mind that there is truth out there uh, and we can verify and, and check context, but we don't want to start becoming totally uh, cynical. Okay, so what can you do um, with your populations about visual misinformation? So you can certainly think about developing some knowledge. So uh, again, you can think about what Kelsey told us about image manipulation. This is really important in scientific articles. So you might want to learn more about this and about uh, retractions for these reasons and for other reasons, right? And you might want to teach people about uh, the importance of critical appraisal and careful image analysis when they are peer reviewing, when they are citing articles, and when they are doing research. Uh, you also want to keep up with developments in technology, right? So helping other people critically engage with, you know, things like ChatGPT and all of these new technologies that we're seeing. Uh, so image or text base is really important. You can host a workshop or a class. Uh, it can be on any sort of topic that is of interest to you. Or if you don't feel that you would want to host the class yourself, you could have local experts come in uh, to do a talk or maybe a panel discussion or, or something like that. Um, you could do a misinformation escape room. So we did the, the one of, that University of Washington has, and it's really, really fun, and that can be in person or virtual. And then think about tailoring events to your audience. So uh, you can do social media for teens or, or TV news potentially for older adults. Uh, we've done some programming for uh, public libraries near us, and we've also done it for, uh, for younger people. Uh, and then you can also get people involved. So have a contest. You know, what, how would your uh, audience, so whatever patron population you have, how would they teach people about misinformation? 
Okay, so you can also think about creating, you know, handouts or brochures, keeping in mind that since this technology changes really quickly, you might have to update your resources. So you want to think about, again, context clues, maybe teaching something like um, how to figure out if something is true rather than giving tips for like, look at the hands for AI images and things like that. Um, and then you can always provide recommended resources like we always like to recommend Medline Plus, for example. You can also consider having some displays, uh, maybe some relevant books. We are huge fans of Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression, or these other two books, Artificial Unintelligence and More Than a Glitch, are by Meredith Broussard. Uh, you might want to include interactivity, so have a, a laptop or an iPad uh, that has the MIT Detect Fake site or one of these other sites that help you figure out whether something is AI-generated or not, uh, or whether it's a, a social media troll. Um, like a bot, or if you don't have something, an opportunity to put up a laptop, you can just have a, you know flaps that that reveal whether someone is real uh, and give people tips on how to tell. Okay, um, so uh, that is what we have for suggestions. I think we have a couple of minutes. I saw that we did have a question in the chat about. Um, Systems levels interventions. Okay, so it says, what about systems level interventions for systematic problems? How could our information ecosystem be more resilient? So that's a really, really good question. Um, and I think that when we're thinking about information ecosystems, the important thing is to remember that we have some trustworthy institutions into that information ecosystem. So maybe if you're thinking about a systems level approach, um, thinking about for an individual, you know, how can you tell which institutions you would want to include in your um, ecosystem? So maybe thinking about, you know, how do we know that people are using fact checkers? How how are these? How do we know that these institutions are trustworthy? Um, but as far as a systems level approach, and maybe Kelsey and Rachel have some ideas, but I think that this is a societal issue that we need to be doing things um, you know we need to be regulating ai we need to be doing a whole lot of things that we're not necessarily doing um, so kelsey and rachel i'll let you you jump in on that one yeah i think that's um, a good response and i also have like one thing that i would add to that is that like um this is something that we talk about a lot like we we really struggle um like personally really be, with this um sort of battle between like, you know, do we tell people how to recognize misinformation or like, what should we be talking about on, on like a societal level? And I think we, we've kind of landed on like, we don't have a lot of power to like change things on a societal level. So like, we try to give people, you know, these tips and whatnot that they can use, hopefully. Um, but we totally agree that this is not like an individual level problem and that there's a much more like systematic approach that needs to be taken on a larger scale to um, combat misinformation as a whole. <clears throat> the um, other thing I will, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. The, the only thing I was going to add, um, just, you know, if you are in a position of uh, relative power and authority, like if you are, for example, you know, on the editorial board of a, um, journal, I mean, that's a place where you can start kind of addressing some of the more systematic issues. Um, also, I mean, if you're at a uh, university and are, are a department chair or something, also rethinking, um, you know, tenure and promotion things that incentivize people to, you know, publish as much as possible, like no matter what they might do ethically. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of that too. And even if you're not in the systems of positions of power still like putting pressure on the people who are um, is definitely an important thing that we can all do. I just want to um, interject just a bit before we go on to more questions. I just want to mention for those of you who might have to leave that the link to the evaluation is in the chat box. And again, whether you want the MLACE or not, we really appreciate your feedback. But also, if you do want the MLACE, be aware that when you take that evaluation and you say yes to that, more information will pop up, like the enrollment code that you will need in order to claim that CE. Um, we have time for a couple more questions, I think.
I know you uh, all were responding to many of the questions and comments in the chat. I really appreciate that. Uh, no, we do not offer chess for this one. Um, and I also wanted to say someone had asked about slides. Now, we don't normally provide the slides, but um, would you like them to contact you to for you to send them? Uh, okay. So take a note of uh, the email addresses here on the slide. So if you have any additional questions that you would like to ask um, our presenters, you can always reach them. Oh, here's one. This might be a reach, but would you have any recommendations for someone still in school to focus on misinformation? I'm not sure. Might have to think more about that one. Alexis, okay. why don't you send us an email um, and we can chat more about that one. I might have to do some digging and try to come up with some things for you, but happy to chat more about it. And, you know, one other thing you can do, like what you're already doing, is attending um, webinars or looking for classes that focus on that topic. I mean, I, I know that um, many uh, academic libraries have live guides with lots of information on that, but there's also different um, organizations that also focus on misinformation, not necessarily the health aspect, but many journalist, uh, journalism schools or organizations also have some of that information. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if you have additional questions, uh, our presenters have their email there on that last slide. They're happy to get in touch with you. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.